microphone, but I need it for the recording, so up with it. <laughs> okay, so that's my topic on the on the uh, screen there, um, and I'd like to start with uh, asking the question: How useful is research for the teacher? How many of you are, as I speak at this time, teaching English either in the university or in schools or wherever? How many of you are actually teachers? Okay, most. Um, those of you who are, those of you who just raised your hands, I would like you to look at the following factors and tell me which of them um, you think are more or less important. I want you to give each a grade of between one and five, where one is pretty useless, didn't help me at all, and five, absolutely essential, I learned a lot from this. Okay? So, just a moment or two to look at that and tell me what score you would give each number. One, pretty useless. Five, absolutely essential. And in between, of course. Everybody did some kind of preparatory teacher training, right? Before you went into teaching? Right, so it's relevant, because some places they don't. But in Hong Kong, I think pretty well everyone does. Okay, let's start off with, I'm going to say one of your preparatory teaching course. Who, who voted one, who voted two, who voted three? And you raise your hands for your vote, okay? So number one, your preparatory teacher training course. Who voted one? Good, so nobody thought it was useless. Uh, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's very high score. Unusually high. When I do this in other places, it usually gets sort of a two or a three. So that's a lot of credit to your teacher training courses. Uh, later courses, seminars, conferences. How useful were these? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so about three and a half, okay? The first one scored four and a half, the second one scores three and a half. Uh, feedback from students. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, about, again, three and a half, I would say. Practical help or advice from colleagues. One, two, three, four, five. Up to four, pretty high for that. Pra uh, your own classroom experience. One, two, three, four, five. Wow. Okay. So that's the highest score so far. And six, reading and professional literature. One, two, three, four, five. Very few fives. Actually, that's probably the lowest score of all of them. Um, the, the basic message coming through is that what's really important to you is your own teaching experience. Courses, some pretty important. Uh, feedback from students, important. Reading the professional literature, relatively unimportant. Now, this is fairly typical of what I hear from teachers around the world, although um, you gave higher scores on the whole to um, the courses and the reading than did other, uh, other teachers I've met elsewhere. Um, conclusion, okay, experience is really important. It's certainly a lot more important than the research. Um, and what we see in, in the literature and in the field is completely conflicting approaches between people who think that the research is useless and people who think the research is really important. So you get um, teachers like Alan Maley and Peter Menges saying, not really relevant, the research doesn't help very much. Read the quotes for yourself. And on the other hand, the academics on the whole coming up with statements like this. Now, I'm going to uh, give you, at the end of my uh, presentation, I've got a whole list of all the references. If anybody wants the presentation and the references, I'm also going to give you my email address at the end of the presentation, so you just write to me and I'll send it to you, okay? 
so you don't need to take photographs and screen them. Okay, so we've got the conflicting approach. This is what people say. I'll say in a moment what my position is on this, so I make myself clear before I start going into uh, the actual research studies I want to look at. I think it's minor, but I think it's significant. Uh, it is, I think, most practitioners would agree that their expertise comes mainly from personal experience, reflection on experience, and so on, interaction with, um, with uh, colleagues and with students, um, and that the research is a minor uh, contributor. Some people would say it has nothing to contribute at all, which I don't agree with. Um, I think it's minor, but I think it's significant. I'm going to say why and how. The problem is how to identify research which is useful and how to make it accessible. Teachers don't read, on the whole, don't read the research very much. Probably here more than in most places. Most places, they, uh, according to research that's been done on teachers reading the research, teachers just don't go there. They don't have, mainly because they don't have time. They're too busy with a busy teaching schedule. I even had one, um, when I gave a, a similar session to this one at an ITAFL once, um, I had a teacher come up to me at the end of the session and say, I don't read the research because my director of studies tells me not to waste my time, quote, unquote, <laughs> reading the literature when I should be preparing lessons. He says, I, I pay you to teach my students in class, I don't pay you to learn um, more professional knowledge. So, that's, that was really discouraging, but, it, but it's there, it's out there, and a lot of people feel that way. So in principle, what, does the, what can the research do? It provides us with insights and information that we could not get from own experience. Okay? Early experience is a primary and important source of knowledge, but it's not enough, and there are things which, because it, they're not within my own experience, I've never experienced them, I've never come across them, I can't learn it unless I get it from elsewhere. And that's where the, uh, the research comes in really useful. It enables us to access things we could not otherwise benefit from, encounter, and it enables us to progress beyond a certain ceiling. Okay? You, can, you can get just so good uh, working from your own experience, your own environment, and your colleagues. If you want to get beyond that, you have to start reading what people are finding out from research. Three types of research I'm going to be looking at. Um, primary empirical research means someone who actually did an experiment, looked at students and found out what worked, what didn't work, and so on. Um, secondary research is um, people who didn't actually do the research themselves, but looked at studies and did what's called meta-analyses, um, summarizing the overall effect size of uh, a whole set of uh, research studies on a particular topic. And then there is secondary research of a different kind, which I'm not going to look at very much here because um, it's not that trustworthy. Um, position papers is someone who's writing because they have a particular ax to grind, they have a particular approach or a particular theory that they want to uh, promote and they say, well, this research shows it, and this research shows it, and that's why I'm right. Um, such papers are liable to be guilty of what's called cherry picking. You know the expression? Um, picking up, the, quoting the research which favors them and conveniently ignoring the one which doesn't. So I'm not too happy about those. I'd rather look at the more academic, objective research studies of either primary or secondary. So the first two are the ones I'm going to be looking at mainly. And I think of those two, the second is probably the most useful um, because um, clearly you're going to get a, a, a reliable overview of modern research if you look at the meta-analyses. Okay, moving on. Four, four things this research can help us do as professional teachers. Firstly, sometimes, very often actually, <laughs> it can confirm what previous assumptions. I always thought that, hmm, ah, great, there's research which backs me up. You know, it's comforting and it's supporting and it's really useful. Secondly, I always thought that, ah, yes, but the research can tell me more about it. 
and can deepen it, can make it more focused and correct. Thirdly, it can simply provide with new information I'd never thought of, I didn't know about. And fourthly, and the most fun, I think, um, we'll get on to that at the end, is it can actually destabilize or make us rethink previous assumptions. I always thought that X, whoops, maybe I was wrong. Here's some research which actually contradicts what I thought. And I have to think again and decide whether I'm going to accept what the research is showing or I'm going to reject it. And if I'm rejected, I have to be pretty sure of myself. Okay, let's take each of these in turn and look at some research studies which I find interesting and helpful. The first one, not so interesting, looking at um, um, research which confirms previous assumptions. I always assumed that it was useful to teach students grammatical rules, right? I mean, there's some people who say it isn't, but actually I was pretty sure it was, and I'm very glad to say that the research actually backs me up. There's this, this seminal article, Norris and Ortega, which is quoted all over the place, um, uh, showing that explicit teaching of grammatical rules and practice and correction and all these conventional things actually do work, actually do uh, improve students' accuracy, uh, a meta-analysis, and there's a very recent one, which I just came across last week, um, saying exactly the same thing. Um, this was based actually on young learners, but still it's an important uh, contributor. Example two, the importance of vocabulary review. Okay, it's not enough to come across a new item once, you need to repeat it. Um, so you need lots and lots of exposures and there's plenty of research which backs that up. Probably between six and 16. Uh, you, you can't really put a definite number because it depends on the level of the student. On the whole, the research shows this particular study in 2001, um, shows that the more advanced the student, the fewer extra reviews they need. The advanced students tend to absorb vocabulary faster, um, and uh, uh, more elementary ones take longer, um, but this is the sort of figure we're looking at, between 6 and 16 reviews. Add more depth and detail to previous knowledge. Um, the example I'm giving here is corrective feedback. Um, and I'm going to look at, the, firstly, various aspects of this. The first thing I'm going to look at is the relative effectiveness of different kinds of oral feedback. Um, and it's, it's an old study, but it's, it's still quoted a lot, and a very important one. Um, this turned around to 1997. What is the most effective way of correcting students' mistakes orally? The, the, the mistakes they make when they're speaking. Um, just before I carry on, uh, am I clear? Yes? yes. Accent all right? Yes. Speed all right? Yes. Okay. Um, types of correction then. We've got recast, which is, let's take an example. A student says, um, I sitting instead of I am sitting. Okay. So recast would mean, I, I hear the student say that, I say, I am sitting. That's all, just recast it. Um, elicitation is, I say to the student, I, I what? I try and get the student to self-correct. Clarification request, I say, what are you doing? I'm asking, focusing on the meaning, and hope that the student will catch themselves and make uh, the correction. Uh, Metalinguistic feedback is, ah, I say, the present continuous, you should have the verb to be in there. You, you skipped it, so you're making a, a, a grammatical um, statement. Explicit correction, I actually say, no, you made a mistake. Make it clear that the, you clarified you made a mistake and you need to correct it. And finally, repetition is just, I say, I sitting, with a, making a face or, a, or with a rising intonation. And again, hopefully they will um, correct themselves. Which do you think is most common? Recast. Recast. Recast is, is 
pretty common. If you look at the uh, Lister and Ranta in their survey of uh, various classes, what they found was that 50, 55% of all directions were simple recasts. The teacher simply repeated the, the, the sentence correctly and hoped that the student picked it up. Licitation, fairly low. I'll show you the other. And it gets lower and lower and lower. And then they asked a really important question. They said, OK, this is the type of um, a feedback that the teachers are giving, which is getting most what they call uptake. Now, uptake does not mean the student gets it right forever and ever, which is too much to ask to find out, but that the student shows that they understood and took on board the correction at that time. They didn't just ignore it. Um, and what do you think was the most effective in getting uptake? Metalinguistic feedback is one effective one. Well, let's look at the statistic. The interesting thing is that recast scores really low. So what, what they found out from this research, which is really, really interesting, is that recast, which is the most popular um, type of oral correction, is actually also the least effective. And the most effective ones, as you say, metalinguistic feedback, actually telling them what the grammar should be, and um, elicitation, getting the student to self-correct. Um, so that's the statistic. Um, an interesting thing about um, recast, let's see what it says here. Simple recast was most often used, but least uptake. One reason why uh, recast has least uptake is, is that the students apparently do not even realize very often that, there was a, that it was actually a correction. They just think the teacher is confirming what they said or echoing what they said. So there's this lovely story which Rod Ellis once told at the lecture I was at of his um, about a teacher in a language school in southern England who was practicing the past tense with his, uh, with his students and he said, what did you do last night, students? And one student raised his hand and said, I go to the pub. And the teacher said, ah, you went to the pub. And the student said, yes, I go to the pub. <laughs> he simply hadn't heard it. Um, and uh, this is, apparently happens more often than we think. Various uh, more recent studies have confirmed this in general, that recast is not very effective. We should be using different uh, techniques. How much should we correct? I was talking about this in the, in the previous session with the teachers who came for the discussion. Um, on the whole, what we see is that students want more, they want the teachers to correct them more, and the teachers want to correct less. The teachers think we should be getting the students to self-correct, and the students say, no, we want the teachers to correct us, or to indicate that there is a mistake and get us to do something about it. Um, and these various um, pieces of research, Professor Lee is actually in Hong Kong. Do any of you know her? Chinese. Uh, Chinese, yes, that's right. Um, and um, but all these people found, including myself in, in my course in English language teaching, um, that the students in general, it's a fairly accepted fact that students want the teacher to correct them. And the conclusion is Lee's um, 2019, it hasn't even come out in paper, I think it's only on the internet so far, um, but her contention is less is more, we should be correcting less and students should be um, correcting themselves, let them, let them take the responsibility. Uh, when students say um, that they want the teacher to correct, they are opting out of responsibility, putting the responsibility on the teacher, a uh, responsibility which they should be taking themselves. I don't actually agree with that. <laughs> Um, I think more is more, but um, I think that when students want teachers to correct them, um, yes, 
as far as possible we should elicit from them what the correction is, but the responsibility for saying what the correct form is um, has to be bottom line teachers because sometimes the students simply don't know. So if in a written uh, text, for example, you just put an underline something and write SP for spelling, or just underline to indicate there's a mistake and expect the student to correct themselves, they may be able to, they may not be able to. And one of our problems is knowing when the student can self-correct and when they can't. Um, and the problem with my idea that more is more, that the more you correct, the better, in, in uh, general terms, um, is that, of course, we just don't have time. You cannot correct every single mistake a student's make in speaking. You certainly cannot correct every single mistake in a piece of written work. And therefore, uh, we have to prioritize and decide we're going to correct as much as we can, but we don't have time to do everything. There just isn't, isn't time if you have a class of 20, 25, 30 students um, with uh, written work coming at you all the time, you have to um, uh, do uh, as much as you can, but you cannot possibly cover it all. My contention is that we should be doing as much as we possibly can, because the students rely on us, and this is where we can help them get it right. Having made the correction, however, or got them to self-correct and then tell them, yes, your self-correction is right. Um, they need to be rewriting or re-saying. They need to be confirming, showing that they've had uptake. Correction during communication paradox is another issue which has been researched. If we correct during communicative work using unobtrusive recasts, okay, quickly doing correct, the student may not, as in the story I told you, the student may not notice they've been corrected at all. So why do it? But if we correct more effectively, we stop them and say, no, you've made a mistake, you ought to be doing this, that, and the other, and, and, and get them to say the correct form, we may throw them off and disturb the whole fluency of, of whatever they're saying, the presentation, whatever it is they're doing. So, so it's, a, it's a dilemma. What has the... Um, research to say about this. Um, research says on the whole, given the choice, in most cases, and I'm being cautious here with all sorts of hedges, uh, in most cases it's probably better to do a, an assertive correction online at the time when the student makes the mistake. Um, this is, again, it's so recent it hasn't even got a date on it because they don't know which issue of the journal that's coming out, but I'll give you the, the reference in a moment. Um, but the, the evidence is that correcting at the point when the mistake is made, not waiting until later, is more effective. Um, and an older survey showed that adult learners anyway, on the whole, tend to prefer to be corrected when they're making a mistake and not have to wait. Um, but the key here, I think, is, sorry, I think that the most important thing here is to ask the students themselves. They're the ones who can judge best. How do you want me to correct you? Would you rather I corrected you as you make the mistake in, an oral, in a presentation or whatever it is you're doing, the oral work, or would you rather um, wait and have me tell you it later? Okay, getting away from Feedback. Incidentally, does anyone want to come back at me on that? On this, because this it's it's really a controversial issue. The thing about um, feedback on errors. Anyone want to comment on that before we go on? I'm okay with uh, with interrupts in the middle of my lectures. I come from Israel, which is where people interrupt you all the time. So I'm quite happy with that. So please, yes, go ahead. What would be the effect? Could you say something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I wonder what the uh, whether there would be um, some kind of an impact to the teacher, and of course, we're looking at say what research has to say about this. Um, if the teacher uses very clear intonation to indicate that there is a mistake there, would there be an impact on the uptake? Yes, I think that's that's uh, what we call what I called repetition in the list before. When you repeat with a 
very significant intonation which indicates there's a mistake, and I think that's one of the more effective techniques, certainly more effective than recast. Okay, please feel free to raise your hands and, and make any points you want to as we go on. Um, the point I want to make here is about, uh, we said before that the research confirms that you need lots of review of vocabulary in order to master it. But what has been researched fairly recently is that the quality, the type of rep repetition is very, very significant. Um, that just repeating something, repeat after me, or copy down, or look at it again, um, doesn't help very much. It doesn't really count as a repeated encounter. Um, not very helpful. What does help is thoughtful retrieval. When you actually get the student to make an effort to retrieve the item from memory, either the form or the meaning. So giving them a definition, asking them to recall what the word was, or giving the word and asking them to give you, tell you what it means, or put it in a sentence or something. But actually doing a little bit of work to retrieve the item rather than simply encountering it. Um, an interesting article, 2008, Carpik and Roda, not from one of the conventional English teaching or all ling applied linguistics journals, but at, I forget what it's called, scientific something, you'll see the, um, the um, reference later. Um, and in their experiment, they gave groups of students 40 words learned in Swahili with an English translation by, it, by them. Um, and they asked the students to review them in one of two ways. One was studying the list again, so looking at the list of translations and reviewing them. And the other was being tested. So they gave them the Swahili and said, what's the English word? Um, and students in the test condition consistently did better. Another uh, one based on learning Hebrew, quite an interesting point here. Um, again, they gave them the word and the meaning, but in this case with pictures, displayed the, the Hebrew word and next to it put a picture that illustrated it. Um, and group one said was asked to review by doing the same thing, looking again at the word and the picture. Group two did this. Again, the word and picture, but there was a three second gap. One, two, three. A, a, a gap of time where they were shown the picture and they had to try to remember the Hebrew word before it flashed up on the screen. In other words, there was a demand to try and retrieve it on their own before it was revealed. Group two learned better, consistently. And the third study um, a, looked at students who learned words through encounter in context in a reading passage, and then looking them up. Um, and again, group one read further passages with the words in context, again, encountering the words again in context. Um, group two, the conventional gap fill exercises, were actually asked to um, do focused exercises which required them to review, to rem remember what the word was. And again, uh, the same result. So it seems fairly consistent that you need to make an effort to retrieve in order to review vocabulary um, successfully. Any comments on that? Carry on? Carry on. Okay. Provide new information. This is the next one I wanted to talk about. Um, Corpus-based frequency lists. Um, the, what I've learned from, from corpus linguistics is how common particular words are. Some, some words or phrases, vocabulary, are much more common than others and therefore worth teaching, and others are very, very rare, and therefore probably not worth teaching or not worth um, uh, focusing on so much. Um, the, particularly for those of you who are teaching, most of you are teaching advanced classes, but some of you are teaching intermediate or upper intermediate, and for those, 
it's really useful to know which are the most essential students, essential items for students to learn at this particular level where they're at. Um, so, um, if you go into these, um, uh, these uh, websites, the first one, Word and Phrase, which is based on uh, corpora set up by, by uh, Brigham Young University. Some of you may have heard of COCA, the Contemporary American, or BNC, the British National Corpus, and all these other corpora. Um, so that's based on that. And what it does is if you feed in a word there, it'll tell you more or less which thousand, where, where it occurs in a, in a frequency list. So if it's within the first 5,000, then it's sort of elementary, it's, uh, sorry, intermediate. Elementary is the first 2,000, 5,000 would be intermediate. Above 5,000, you're getting into real academic stuff. Um, and so, if you want to know how how important a word is for them to learn, um, how frequent it is, you feed it, and then it immediately gives you the answer. Um, the bottom one, English profile, um, it will give you the level. You don't use them so much here in uh, Hong Kong, but in Europe, for example, they use the CEFR levels A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on, um, and that analyzes. Uh, the word or the phrase, uh, a whole phrase, um, by uh, how advanced it is. So it's quite useful um, to do it. For materials writers and teachers, selecting vocabulary to teach in a textbook, say for intermediate um, learners, particularly your sort of vocabulary profiling tools where you can you type in a text into the box in one of these um, sources here, just show you an example. Okay, you paste or type text, say it says text inspector of the word um, English profile, um, and you type it in and it will come up with words or phrases color coded according to how frequent they are. So it's quite useful. Again, mainly for those of you who are teaching intermediate rather than advanced, but still very useful. So that's, that's the main information thing, I think, the, the corpus, uh, corpus studies of, of all sorts of um, different aspects of the language are really, really interesting. I, I, I find it just quite fun and interesting to learn about for my own interest rather than uh, for the immediate benefit to my teaching. Okay, last one I said which is most fun, most interesting is I thought this was the way to do something, and the research is telling me it isn't, I have to rethink. Let's look at some examples. Guessing from context. Um, a lot of research on this, it, it's, it's very um, popular among teachers, certainly in Europe, I don't know quite how here, but um, it's very sort of accepted that you ought to be asking students to guess reading from context. You shouldn't be telling them what the meaning is, but telling them to guess from context. And the evidence is that on the whole they can't. Not because they don't know how to guess, not because they don't know English, but because in the majority of cases, an unknown word is not guessable from context. The context does not provide enough clues, and I'll give you an example in a moment. They looked at, from their point of view, um, they looked at a text which for a, a particular level of student they knew certain words would not be known and they asked themselves, if I were a student, would I be able to guess this word from the context? Assuming that they knew all the words around, okay? Um, and of the 70 unknown words they identified, they found that 29 of them had no contextual clues whatsoever. There's no way they could possibly guess. There were partial clues for 28, so the students might or might not be able to get more or less what the word was. And clear clues only for 13 out of the 70. When they gave the text to the students and asked them to guess what the words meant, they got 17, average 17 right out of the 70. Nasage's um, um, research, uh, he played, 
fair with them. He gave them a text which 95% of it he knew they knew, so it was it was fairly easy, relatively easy text. But the 5% they didn't, they had to guess. And they used think, what's called think aloud protocols, where they actually spoke into a microphone and said how they were thinking, how they were guessing the new words in each case. But the bottom line was that in more than half the cases, they guessed wrong. And this seems to be a fairly stable statistic in, in uh, other studies I've looked at, that about 60% you can't guess, and about 40% you may be able to guess. Um, and this study found the same thing, that on the whole they couldn't guess, but an interesting extra piece of um, information they got, which is also seems to be a stable result from a lot of uh, research studies, is that they, students tend to overestimate what they know. They think they've guessed right, and they probably haven't. Okay, give me a break now and you see if you can do this one. Here are seven missing words. How many can you guess? You take a minute or two, and perhaps with a partner if you like, or on your own if you prefer, write down what you think any of them is. You don't have to guess them all, but see how many you can make a reasonably good guess. I'll show you the answers. You tell me about how many of them you've not yet. Okay, another minute or two. <laughs> any of them, anyone would like to say um, they're fairly sure of what the answer is? Any of them? Or more or less the meaning, not the exact word, but more or less the sort of meaning you think? For any of the numbers? Research study, okay, could be. Could be self. Intrinsic, could be intrinsic, yeah. Or empirical. You're neither of you right, but okay. <laughs> could be. Mm -hmm. Scaffolding. Yeah. Or choice. Choice or scaffolding, yes. I think the last one is certainly like a repetition of the phrase motivation and engagement. Engagement, yeah. And four could be depends. Sorry? Four? Depends on, yes. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> I've got to get through my materials. <laughs> okay, three you got right. Yeah. Right? Seven you got right. And, and seven you got right. But does it have to be this word? Or to it be a word that's synonymous with the meaning? Okay, for example? Autonomous motivation. I mean, what kind of motivation? Well, you suggested um, intrinsic, um, yeah, but then a student might go away thinking that autonomous meant intrinsic. See what I mean? That they'll assume that the word means what they what they guessed it, which is dangerous. <laughs> uh, the thing was that, that, that 
Okay, let's be generous and say you got three out of seven right. But it's still less than 50%. And there's no way it's because you don't know English. It's because it's the fault of the text, not your fault. Um, on the whole, a natural text does not betray the, um, the meaning of a word by context, on the whole. So 50, more than 50% are likely to be unguessable. Yes? Well, I guess the fact that the testing like, condition... You need to take a microphone. I guess the fact that this is a testing condition, I mean, like, it, it, it's got to do with the testing condition that you're requiring the production of a vocabulary item here makes it a very different kind of um, exercise than if you only actually ask the students to indicate, you know, for example, what's the meaning of this word over here on, say, line 13 or something like that. Yes, it's what, what are you saying? Um, yeah. Asking for the meaning of a word is not production? No, I mean, like, you, you know, um, the fact that you're, un you're conceptualizing uh, understanding, or, I mean, the effect of guessing mm -hmm. by looking at lexical production you know, rather than comprehension or perhaps the understanding of meaning, um, that could have some impact on the way we interpret the results because you're requiring students actually, first of all, know what the meaning is, and secondly, yeah. the parts um, of I'm asking creation. you to produce the word. My students, I would only ask, because the word would be there, right? I wouldn't be a blank. The word, the word would actually be there. I would ask them to tell me what the meaning of that word is. Okay. So from the students' point of view, it would be just comprehension. Right. I'm doing it had to do it with the way you did, because if I gave you the word, you'd know what it meant anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they, I give, with the students, there's the word there, it's a genuine, authentic word, they just don't know what it means. So they'd have to tell me what they thought it meant, or even a translation, or something like that. But yes, I take your point there, yes. But my, my point is that the words, in any case, the meanings of words, are not guessable on the whole from context, even if you have um, morphological help there, I'll be talking about that in a later talk, later this week. Um, general conclusion, if your aim is vocabulary learning, not meaning fluency or something, but if you want them to learn a particular vocabulary item, guessing meaning from context is mo mostly not worth doing, it's better just to tell them what it means. Okay? Example two, so that's one destabilizing. I always thought it was a good idea to ask students to guess. I had to rethink in, in light of the research. Example two, um, teaching words in lexical or semantic sets, like teaching um, all the parts of the body or all the emotions or you know, a whole set of um, similar words together is not very effective. Does it help? The original research was done in 1993. Does it help learners to master a new set of lexical items if they are all members of semantic set? Um, clothes, animals. This is mainly relevant to beginners, not so relevant to your situation, but I'm bringing it just because it's, it's a definite destabilizing thing for a lot of teachers teaching um, uh, students in schools. So, the experiment was they presented them with pseudo words and said these words mean all, all have are all connected with clothes, and these words, the ones here, are all are, are mixed. Okay? These words, then they took the same words and gave them different meanings. So the same words here are mixed meaning, and these ones are all to do with the field of clothes. And then they look to see which of the two groups, which words they remembered the meanings of, and found that the learners consistently learned the unrelated items better. And this has been done lots of times in different languages. I mean, this was done with a, with a mythical language, unreal language. It was done by wearing using Japanese, Urton Taken was um, Turkish, Papadnezi was Greek, Wilcox and Medina, I don't remember, I think it was Spanish, but I'm not sure. Uh, but they all came up basically with the same result. They're teaching the same sorts of words, new words. Teaching a set of new words that all have to do with the same lexical set um, is not very efficient. However, 
words that are linked together syntagmatically, in other words, horizontally rather than vertically. Okay, a vertical list would be all the colors, parts of the body, and so on. Horizontally, I'm talking about words that would go together in a sentence, in a natural situation or sentence. So, for example, blue plus sky is more better than blue plus red. General conclusion, materials writers are recommended, therefore, not to teach a whole set of words that all mean the same thing, or will have uh, all... Uh, are related to the same lexical area. Uh, and teachers, if they're presented with a course book or course materials which does present vocabulary like that, do present vocabulary like this, then to try to contextualize each on its own rather than teaching them as a list. Um, further notes and some in, uh, things which I learned from my own teaching um, is that a, a problem with lexical sets for elementary students means that you're going to teach all sorts of uh, pretty useless words. For example, you're teaching parts of the body. So head and hands and eyes and ears are arguably important, but toes and knees are arguably not very important, even for advanced students. Um, research relates to the first learning of items, so uh, using lexical sets for review and so on is probably um, useful. But another thing which here does apply to advanced students, is that by the same principle, teaching for the first time any set of items which can be confused is probably not a good idea. So teaching homonyms or synonyms or homophones, like accept and accept, together might result in um, confusion rather than um, good learning. Anyway, let's move on to something which is more relevant to your situation. Use of digital technology. Again, very in, very recommended in the literature. And I'm going to look at two pieces of research here. One by Makaro et al. in language teaching on the use of CAL, computer assisted language learning, and its relationship with learning, and another relatively recent survey by the OECD on uh, what they did was they looked at countries which are scoring very high on the PISA results. You know PISA is the international um, uh, tests of um, academic achievement. So, so the OECD countries which scored very high and looked at which OECD countries use computers most and saw if there was any relationship between them. Mokaro et al. came to this conclusion. And this is lack of evidence. I'll be coming on to lack of evidence in the, in the part of the last section of my talk. It will run about five, ten minutes over, I'm sorry. Um, but here they're saying there's no evidence that teachers who use the technology are teaching any more successfully than teachers who don't. Or the learners who are learning through the technology are learning any better. Um, there just is no, it's sort of negative finding here. Um, the other one is even worse. A negative correlation. And I looked at their statistic, and it, it, it's quite amazing, you know, what they, the really high-scoring countries like Korea right at the top there, um, in high-scoring in PISA, and you've got um, the, the same country scoring very low as to the amount of computers being used in the classroom, relatively. And they summarize their finding like this. What they're saying basically here is that using computers to some extent, a moderate extent, is probably a good thing. But it's not the more you use it, the better. If you get beyond a certain point, it starts getting negative. There is a sort of an optimal level. Any comment on that? 
They're talking about using it, using them in class. What is? Uh, I mean, is it online learning, for instance, or just using paperless? Um, they 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 talked about using the teacher use, student use um, in class. Actually, classroom classroom learning is actually using tablets or using interactive whiteboards and things like this in for classroom teaching. That was the main thing they were looking at. But they also looked at things like how much the students using them at home. You have to read the the uh, reference I've given you is actually online. You can actually read the research online. Really, really interesting. And I, obviously I've given only a very brief overview of it, but they went into quite a lot of detail as to the way the computers were used in different ways. Um, but the, what they came to the conclusion, there is such a thing as excessive use of digital tools. Excessive use which actually results in negative uh, outcomes. I want to give a, a couple of postscripts. One is where there is no supporting research by hypothesis, where we think everybody says that, but is there any research on it? And what I'm saying is, if there is no research to support something, then we should think twice as to whether it's true or not. Um, and the very, um, if a popular approach method or model has no clear research evidence to support it, um, think again. And the examples here are um, learning styles. VAK, VAK, there's absolutely no research at all to show that it, it actually exists at all, or that teaching a student by visual or auditory means it make, means that they'll learn better. Um, you're a linguistic programmer, if you've ever heard of it. No research at all. Multiple intelligences, even Howard Gardner himself says, no, there's no actual scientific evidence, but it's a, um, a nice thing. You know, interesting theory. And I think in this case, in the, in the case of multiple intelligences, um, I would say it, it's a very interesting theory which made me think about how my students learn, how different they are, in different ways their minds work. But it doesn't actually have any scientific basis. Um, postscript two, where good research is less helpful, it helps us less when it's interesting research, and I have enjoy reading it, but didn't really help me much with my teaching. Um, there are two examples here. I'm only going to give one, and I'm going to skip the second because we're running out of time. We want to leave time for discussion. But the first um, example I want to give is um, research on spoken grammar, which is really, really interesting. I, I enjoy it very much, particularly Mike McCarthy and Ronald Carter's um, research on um, aspects of spoken grammar or spoken vocabulary come to that. Um, for example, the fact that spoken grammar is mostly coordinate sentences rather than compound sentences, um, and there's a lot of ellipsis, skipping things, um, heads and tails. Um, he's a great guy, my uncle, instead of my uncle is a great guy, putting things at the end of sentences, the beginning of sentences, and so on and so on. Um, but the question comes up, should we teach learners spoken grammar? But the fact is that most of the features I've been talking about, fragments, utterances, heads and tails, ellipsis, occur in any language. Think about any other language you speak, and you'll, you'll see that actually they occur in that as well. Um, and so probably don't need teaching, there's probably not an awful lot which we can learn from this from the point of view for, of practical implications for teaching. The other one, which I'm going to skip, as I say, um, but you can read it if you want to uh, download the, the uh, presentation later, is the Natural Development or Order Acquisition by Peenemann. So I'll skip this and move on to conclusion. Research, then, can be enlightening, interesting in itself, just fun to read, likely to enhance classroom teaching or materials design, but not very accessible to teachers. Main problems are time, and there's shit, enormous amount being published all the time, how can you possibly keep up with it? Difficulty, lack of clarity, some people don't write very well, these researchers, they write in very opaque language, which is not very accessible. Um, relevance and usefulness of some of it for practice, not that relevant, not that important. Hence, a need for selection, need for mediation, which I wrote an article about at one point. Um, 
people who read the research, learn it, and mediate it to teach us at conferences or journals, webinars, and so on. Thank you very much, and over to you for questions. And here's my email if anybody wants the, uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. discussion so because most of you didn't come for the open discussion so it might be a chance for you in fact to ask related questions or something you know about uh, Penny's uh, expertise in methodology pedagogy classroom teaching yeah so feel free to ask any questions yes Karen's thank you very much uh, would you please talk more about the uh, mediation um, to be done by teachers when reading uh, journal articles, especially there might be conflicting results in the research studies. So the uh, mediation to be done by teachers. Um, not to be done by teachers, to be done for teachers. My, my point is that because teachers cannot possibly, given a busy teaching schedule, cannot possibly scan through all the art the major journals and select things that are worth reading, read them and apply them. They therefore depend on people who do have the time. And who then not only have the time to read themselves, but also have the time and the motivation to mediate them to teachers, to mediate them to teachers in the sense that um, someone like me, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a, an example of a mediator, or someone like Jeremy Harmer or Scott Thornbury or various other people, who don't actually do research themselves, but consume it in large quantities, because I'm not teaching anymore. So I have the time, the luxury of being able to sit down by my computer for days on end, look through latest um, issues of journals, note things that are really interesting, and then think of ways I can convey them to teachers. Um, and, and I think because teachers don't have the time, we really need mediators like that. People who then go to conferences, give sessions like this one, for example. Um, and teachers can then benefit without having to spend hours and hours going through all these, uh, these journals and books and articles trying to find things which are relevant and reading them. And, and a lot of them, as I say, are inaccessible. Some of them I don't understand. I mean, I'm not very good at statistics, for example. Very often I, I get to the, the, the pages and pages of tables with statistics and all sorts of symbols I don't understand. And I skip it and I move on to the discussion and conclusions which sort of explain to me in simple language I can understand. And then I mediate it onwards to teachers. Uh, and that's the only way teachers can really, most teachers who, who do not have the time um, to, to access the, uh, the material can get it. Have I answered your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, I actually, I have two questions about teaching vocabulary. One is, um, you know, uh, most of the students pay attention to the grammar mistakes, and as a, uh, as a teacher, I also pay attention to that. But I think, except for the grammatical problems, I think vocabulary plays a, another important role in the, uh, especially in English writing and uh, speaking. So, um, I try to especially for the collocations. So I tried to uh, do some, give some feedback and give some corrections to the students in terms of the vocabulary. But it seems that um, the students who, who we call good students, they will correct it. But for the students, for most of the students, they will not uh, choose to correct it. So it seems they, so this makes me think, rethink that whether I should Pay more attention to, or to the vocabulary teaching in, uh, in terms of the such as collocations and other mistakes, is, uh, express, uh, except for the uh, spelling mistakes, which we always pay attention to. Uh, and it should should it be another focus for English language teaching? Uh, yeah, this is my first question. And. Uh, Let me answer that, and then okay. you go on yeah. to the next question. Let me leave this one. Yeah. Yes, it should. Vocabulary is far more important than grammar. 
far more important for comprehension, far more important for writing. Um, it, it's the basis of the language. And um, grammar, okay, yes, you also need to have correct grammar, but I think if you're talking about the amount of time we need to devote um, to aspects of language in our lessons, I think the majority of the time needs to be uh, devoted to developing and expanding the vocabulary. Um, that, that's what carries meaning. Obviously, the vocabulary is mainly what carries meaning. And there has been a, a lot of research done in recent years on how much vocabulary you need for certain academic levels, and it's an enormous amount. Um, not all of which they can um, learn by incidental just coming across it in texts. They often need the teacher to focus on say, did you notice this word? This is what it means. Did you notice this phrase? This is what it means. Note it down. So really, really important um, to teach grammar, to teach vocabulary, yes. But na naturally, what we notice on the whole is, is grammatical mistakes rather than lexical mistakes, and that's what pulls our attention. So you're quite right that it's a, it's a temptation. Yes. Uh, you had so another question. Yeah, another question is that uh, I have, during my teaching, uh, I have tried to uh, do some vocabulary activities, such as uh, uh, I will give one uh, one central word and ask them to do to make a collocation to the uh, according to the uh, word the word we focus. Mm -hmm. uh, then, after students uh, give us some ideas, they will find out um, word where on the whiteboard or on the blackboard. Yeah. It seems, that, and I will tell them mm, actually this is uh, this collocation is better than that one. Then they will have a discussion about why like this. I saw that it is um, to some extent it is uh, it works to uh, improve students' proficiency in written language in English. But I think I wonder whether uh, there is m more effective or efficient ways to teach vocabulary, especially in terms of collocations. You got um, two hours to spare. <laughs> Stop. <Start. laughs> yes. Uh, yes. There's lots of effective ways of doing it. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about this in my, my session on Friday. One sort of quite a lot of tips about vocabulary. Um, but um, and I have a book called Vocabulary Activities, which has quite a lot of advanced um, activities for expanding advanced vocabulary there. So. Yes, lots of things, but I, I think the idea of, of taking single words and looking at the chunks or collocations which they um, develop into, I think that's really, really useful. And one, one nice thing to do is to give them a word and tell them to look it up in the dictionary. A word they already know. I mean, normally, we look up in the dictionary of words we don't know. Go to an English-English dictionary, look up a word you do know, and find all the other ways it can be used and, and the different... Um, collocations and chunks it, it's part of. I remember once going to a talk by um, an editor of the Oxford Dictionaries, and he said that the major expansion of English is not new words coming into the language, it's new meanings coming in from old words. So that's quite a, a useful activity to do. Uh, very interesting to be thinking about research from the point of view of researchers um, who uh, as you mentioned, have the luxury and time for um, extensive you know, examination of their data. Um, so, Penny, I was wondering what would be your opinion on the adequacy of uh, you know, research components on teacher education programs, initial preparation programs for teachers, because when I was an uh, undergraduate um, doing my education degree, um, half out of 40 courses I had to take um, you know, was a research method course, when I did my master's was slightly better, it was one out of nine, and when I got to my PhD stage, of course, 100% was researched, but then really, I mean, if you, if we want teachers uh, who have the capacity to um, look at research adequately and critically, um, you'd need them to understand uh, and be methodologically informed, and even better, perhaps, they need to have the capacity to examine their own classroom practices through research that they themselves conduct. So just wondering what would be your opinion on the role of teacher research? So do you think that um, there has to be some kind of attention being uh, paid to um, you know, getting teachers to become you know, proficient researchers of their own kind? Um, it would be very nice, but they don't have the time. 
Um, if you look at teacher research, action research, which has been done and published, it's 99%, I would say, probably 100%, teachers who are participating in some kind of program or a advanced degree course where it's part of the requirements they have to do the teaching research. Teachers rarely will have the time or energy or motivation to do their own research on their own teaching, which is sad, but that, that's, that's where we're at. Um, so I think that one of, one of the functions of the, the kinds of courses you're talking about is to give teachers the opportunity and the motivation and the framework to do their own research to find out things. And it also enables them to become, as it were, research literate and understand the, the research done by others as well. I hope that answered your question. I or, think would it be about, or would it be about advocating for more scholarship time for, um, say, EAP practitioners or other teachers in their own context? Yes, I think one, one of the problems is, and like, like I told you the story about the, the teacher who came up to me after this talk in, uh, in IOTEFL, the problem is that doing or reading the research is not built into the job description of most teachers in the world today. What is built into their job description is thou shalt teach <laughs> 20 lessons a week or 30 lessons a week or even 40 lessons a week and that's it. There's no stipulation as there is with doctors, for example, that they are required, or it is implied that they are required to keep up with the research. Um, until, unless and until reading the research is built into teachers' job descriptions, we're not going to get anywhere. Sadly. Those of you who are in charge of setting up teachers' jobs, think about it. <laughs> uh, questions or maybe just share of experience? Was there anything in, in the talk which, I mean, some of it was not so relevant, I realize, but anything that particularly relevant to your situation in Hong Kong that you'd like to tell me? I it, really need to know. Quite, this. It's quite it's relevant because, uh, uh, it's quite uh, relevant because, um, well, I teach in a language center, and uh, we've, we've been told that basically ours is a teaching unit, you know, given the institutional context, and therefore research is relatively less important is seen as less important um, and it, it, but then the thing is um, if we if we keep having these two as dichotomies all right teaching versus research then in a way uh, in this way we are, in no way are we able oh, to get the rich yeah exactly and, and, and it's it, it can be quite self-defeating if we emphasize right that we try to uh, improve our teaching but at the same time we see that as something that is added on top of our job Mm. Yeah. See research. So I, I think uh, you know bridging you know the, the dichotomies would be very uh, useful in terms of uh, seeing this as a conceptual change. You know, so yeah, because uh, I mean even even now, and I can understand a lot a lot of my younger colleagues they feel that well they don't have the time, and and when it comes to you know very practical things like contract appraisals, you know, uh, they feel that well. Uh, uh, how many papers I have produced is not relevant, so why, you know, so, yeah. Do you get any kind of funding to uh, attend conferences, this sort of thing, in, in your...? In most tertiary language centers, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. Much. That's not much. That's <laughs> not much. <laughs> it's to go but to some. some. Well, local conferences are really expensive now. A lot of them are around $2,000. And I mean, at my place, at the University of Science and Technology, it would be It's a real problem. There's a, an, a, um, an associated problem, which I didn't want to get into in this talk at all, is the difference in prestige between researchers and teachers. Where research is seen as somehow more prestigious than actually getting down there and doing the teaching. Um, and um, this leads to 
other problems, which, as I said, I didn't want to get into here, but maybe sometime in the future. Yes. I was interested in now what you meant. You mentioned the term scholarship when you were talking about teachers as teachers and research, and I think that's quite interesting because we think about research as a grant with a report and all that kind of thing, whereas scholarship seems a bit more manageable. Perhaps. Yes. So if yes. you expand on what you mean by scholarship. Um, I, I think. This gentleman over here used the word scholarship. I'm okay. not sure if I, right. I used it, but, but certainly, um, yes, I, I think there is a, a distinct difference between research and scholarship, and, and scholarship is um, any kind of advanced, thoughtful consideration of issues to do with the, with the profession. Um, and research tends to be identified with particular studies, sort of empirical studies of, of particular uh, kinds of evidence. Uh, scholarship has to do with thinking, reflecting, um, in-depth investigation. Um, research has to do with writing articles and getting published. So would you and say scholarship <laughs> means an output or not? Sorry? Would you say that scholarship, if you were, say, a university language centre teacher, not having time for research, scholarship, I mean, perhaps reading around. Would you say it always needs to have an output? Yes. Yeah. So I think so. I think, I think you need to have output. Um, yes. Not sure I would call myself a scholar. I would certainly not call myself a researcher, but I'm nearer to what, uh, what you mean by scholarship and uh, research. Anything else which is particularly relevant to you? So it's really important for me to know what, what was particularly relevant or anything which was particularly irrelevant for my own knowledge and edification. Well, I was actually very intrigued by uh, you know this idea of. Um, using digital uh, medium, um, not necessarily achieving um, the same results as using traditional media, as I understand. Because there has been such a lot kind of, um, of developments uh, around, you know, digital, use of digital in education. And the trend, of course, is to use more. Um, when I was working um, at Cambridge, uh, University Press. We did uh, something like, you know, um, a forum or focus group with students, asking them whether they prefer to, uh, well, study using um, computers or laptops uh, and reading books um, on screen or using physical books. And interestingly, uh, well, the result was that they won both because they don't want to carry books, but if they prepare for, for exams, they want to use physical books because they remember better. And it's, uh, it's about the visual memory. It's about kind of scrolling the screen or kind of remembering the page. And probably it has something to do with that, with you know, the image of the word on the page and the layout of the page that kind of sticks better in your um, yeah. Um, if you have to read an article, how many people here prefer to read it on screen? An, a, an academic article. How many people prefer on paper? Yeah. Interesting. I prefer on screen. <laughs> and I'm old, you know. <laughs> it's not a question of age. Yeah. It's a question of learning style, if you like, what, what, what's, what's convenient to you. Um, but. The research is on your side. I mean, the, the research says that there's been research on on um, students. I didn't bring it as one of my examples here, um, but students in the states were asked whether they prefer a digital textbook or a paper textbook, and the vast majority prefer paper. To this day, I mean, we're talking about digital natives here. We're talking about people who grew up with computers. Um, um, I, th I think what what's happening is that we've got both. The, the question
question in the next gen for the next generation, the question of whether you should be using digital or non-digital tools will be totally irrelevant because it will be so taken for granted that you use digital tools for this, you use paper for that. And, and they both have a place, and it depends on you and the situation which you're going to use, that really the controversy won't arise at all. Um, and there are things which I use, um, I don't, I prefer reading on a Kindle to reading a book. I prefer reading um, a, academic articles on, on Google Scholar on my screen rather than, um, rather than downloading or printing them out or looking at a paper journal. Um, but there are other things which I much prefer paper for than pencil. And um, each one of us will have their own preferences. Um, when the dust settles, I think this will not be an issue. People will just assume that you always use computers for this and you always use paper for this. And, and, and that's, where, that's where we're at. It's not a question that one, one is better than the other.